Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we've uh, successfully started the webinar. Um, I can see some people um, filing in the attendees list. So we'll just give a, a, a couple of minutes, maybe a minute or two for more people to, to arrive. Um, while we do that, um, I guess I'm an unfamiliar face um, in, this, in this seminar series. Um, so I'm Peter Whitewood. I'm uh, the head of program in history at York St. John University. Um, I'm a, a specialist in the Soviet Union, uh, 1920s and 1930s. And it's a pleasure to uh, chair this event today, which is part of Jim Cooper's uh, 1980s International Research Group. Um, so I'm very happy to welcome uh, the next speaker in this ongoing series of talks. Um, it's Dr. Ep Annis, um, who is an associate professor with Town University, uh, but also lectures at uh, Ohio State University. Um, recent publications include uh, a book, Soviet uh, Postcolonial Studies, A View from uh, the Western Borderlands, and an edited uh, collection also recently published, Coloniality, Nationality, Modernity, A Postcolonial View of Baltic Cultures Under Soviet Rule. Um, and so we have a, a very kind of interesting uh, talk awaiting uh, for us today on Estonia and culture um, in the 1980s. Um, a little bit of housekeeping just before we uh, get going. Um, I think this is um, similar to uh, talks we've had, you know, you've had in the past. Um, first, it's been recorded, but that doesn't really matter because um, the only way for the Q&A to take place is through the, 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 the typing function through the Q&A box. So please, as the talk is ongoing, if you've got questions, please add those into the Q&A function and we will pick those up um, once Ep has finished her talk. Um, I think we're, we're, we're just talking before we start the webinar. To, we want to make sure there's enough time for questions. Um, and so the talk might go on for half an hour, 40 minutes or so. We'll see how it goes. Um, I think that might be more or less it from me. Just a couple more things before I hand over. Firstly, I know Jim tells me that there is another talk taking place on the 29th of March, the next one in this series. Um, and at the same time, just as a, another advertisement announcement, another talk we've got at York St. John on the 29th of March too. We've got a, 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 a another webinar talk with uh, Neil Kinnock, who is the um, former uh, leader of the uh, Labour Party for, for many years, um, who's going to be giving a talk at York St. John also on Zoom on the 29th. And I think Jim is going to circulate the details of, of that talk for people who are interested. Um, so um, I think that might be it from me. I'm very happy to hand over to Dr. Ep Annis and uh, we will begin the talk. So thank you. Thank you, Peter, and also thank you, Jim, for organizing this whole uh, seminar series, which I think is incredibly promising. Uh, let me share, I actually want to share a few things with you today. And first one, first one is, uh, uh, yes, let's go back to the beginning. For some reason, it's taken us to the end of that particular. So this is a slideshow from, uh, uh, and these are photographs from 1980. And uh, the slideshow is composed later. So you do have some comments in English, which are already dating from a later period. But I think it's good to see just a little bit of a visual imagery of this particular era. So of course, we are uh, um, talking about the modern modern period so you have you have a mix in Tallinn of medieval buildings and also very modern 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 even like skyscraper type buildings and uh, you see here also 1980 was the year when there were olympic games right in the soviet union and part of that was also taking place in so this is one of the kind of a landmark events 
of the era. And uh, what's, what's interesting is that it was quite tricky in some ways because there were a number of countries uh, did not participate because uh, you, know, you are not supposed to have Olympics in an occupied territory. So obviously the typical Soviet narrative was that this is a, all a free country and the Estonians were very happy to join the Soviet Union. The reality the Estonians knew very well was something else. And uh, the Olympic Games really caused a lot of uh, basically like, conversations about how okay we are actually living in an occupied country, which was not the you know school textbook narrative. And so there were new buildings uh, built in Tallinn. There was some interesting produce available at the store that wasn't available earlier. And at the same time, there was this feeling like okay yes, but some people are not coming here because we are actually an occupied country. And so uh, when we talk about the 1980s, I would say there are two 1980s um, when we're talking about the Soviet bloc. There's one that starts about 1978 and it lasts until the Gorbachev uh, perestroika. And then that second half is absolutely different. And I'm today, I'm focusing on that first part, but I'm of course very happy to answer to questions also concerning the other part. But the second part, there's so many books written, you know, it's quite relatively well, well known, you know, sequence of events, what's happening there. The beginning of the 1980s, there's very little uh, um, available about like just like general moods, everydayness of it, what were the, some of the you know motivating uh, events and uh, and how did people relate to the era? So I'm focusing more on that aspect. And uh, it was starting from about 1978. This was a new wave of uh, ideological pressure in the Soviet Union. You see a lot of like war veterans and parades in these images. Uh, and maybe the first uh, hallmark. Uh, thing to mention was that from in 1976, uh, uh, from that year onwards, PhD uh, dissertation could only be defended in Russian and in Russia, either in Leningrad or in Moscow. You could not write, for example, if your work was about Estonian literature, Estonian language, you could only defend it, you present your work as written in Russian, which was absurd, of course. And I would also note it didn't mean that people started writing all academic work in Russian, but you finished the dissertation and then someone translated it. And then it was sent to Moscow or to Leningrad, mostly, most typically Moscow. And it was a years and years long process of getting it accepted, etc. So there was also a sad uh, case and someone's nerves just didn't, uh, you know, couldn't stand it, and there was a very famous scholar who committed suicide in Estonia in the 1980s. And then 1978, uh, there is a change in, uh, in uh, Republican leadership. Karl Weiner becomes a new secretary of the Estonian Communist Party. And uh, presumably the first secretaries were always supposedly local and then second uh, secretaries were supposedly appointed from, from, from the center. Well, in fact, also first secretaries were in, uh, appointed from the se uh, center. They were supposedly local. However, Karl Weiner barely uh, spoke any Estonian. And if he spoke, it was with horrible accent. Mostly he just spoke in Russian. And uh, there were new laws uh, about um, uh, advancing uh, Russian language schooling. So there, is, there are these wonderful names to these regulations. So one is called on measures to further improve the learning and teaching of the Russian language. Then there was another one, further improvement of the acquisition and teaching of the Russian language. And uh, in 1980, uh, a new uh, minister of education was appointed in Estonian, Elsa Kretschkina, who again barely spoke any Estonian. 
which was just like such an ironical uh, fact that whoever is supposed to be responsible for education doesn't even uh, speak local language. So had a very strong accent, was hard to understand. And so Russian language uh, lessons, there were more of them, and they the plan was already start in the kindergarten, in the preschools, with teaching, uh, you know, three-year-olds Russian. And this was established in some uh, preschools, but not in all, to my knowledge. And then other kind of, uh, uh, you know, frustrating fact for many of us, of course, the Afghanistan war is starting. And uh, Estonian uh, young men are also sent to that war, whereas, of course, these, uh, you know, Estonians had nothing to do with this conflict. They were absolutely in an, uninterested. But um, about so 1600 young men were sent to Afghanistan from Estonia. And it, once they came back, these people, you know, had very serious mental issues, those who came back. And so there were other aspects like that. There's Johannes Hint story. So in 1981, there was an arrest of a very famous figure. Johannes uh, Hint had, had, uh, was an inventor basically. And he had this uh, special construction bureau called Disintegrator, which was unique in the Soviet Union. Uh, so there was uh, his company or the company that he led uh, invented some specific technology like ro rotating mill that they called designator and they, they processed mixtures like fine grinding and some mechanical activation of, of, of water and so this was a new building material that he came uh, up with. Uh, called silicon seat. It was very, very commonly used in this era. Lots of factories were set up in different ones in, the, in Estonia, but also actually in Japan and in Italy. So this guy was actually a good source for hard currency in the Soviet Union. And then his company or the company that he led, it wasn't owned by him, uh, they also started to work with biochemical uh, uh, biotechnological products. Uh, seems like uh, also Americans were interesting and interested and seemed like maybe there's uh, potentially a very good drug for can uh, curing cancer that they uh, were developing. But in 1981, uh, this man, Johannes Hint, was arrested. Uh, just, you know, on some fabricated uh, 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 basis. And uh, he was in prison, presumably sentenced to prison for 15 years, but he died in prison four years later in 1985. So, yeah, in many ways, it was kind of a tightening, tightening uh, ideological pressure uh, during this period. And it led to student arrests. Here we are seeing these beautiful images on screen. However, in 1980, there were also student arrests in several parts of Estonia. This led to investigations at high schools. Uh, my high school, for example, I wasn't in high school yet, but my, uh, my sister was. So he, she also was interrogated, just like all high schools in uh, in Estonian speaking high schools in, in Tallinn era, at least people were just questioned. And there were arrests, there were imprisonments. Someone who uh, I knew personally was, uh, was uh, sentenced to prison as a high schooler for one year. He and his friends were, uh, did burn a Soviet flag. And uh, so he spent one year in a prison and came out in 1982, couldn't finish high school, went to an evening school, but went to university afterwards. But uh, he did be uh, become a heavy drinker and, and died later in his early 40s. So I would say he was one of the victims of the regime. Uh, and then there was also a letter of 40, a protest letter of Estonian intellectuals 
it was decided that 40 people uh, will sign it, uh, only one uh, from each family, so that if there would be imprisonments, then there would be someone who would take care of children, it was very carefully prepared. Uh, and uh, this letter was sent to different, uh, different publications also abroad. Um, uh, Voice of America talked about it, but there was no official mention in the, in the Soviet press. And uh, what was written in this letter was uh, like severe alarmist, uh, alarmist, you know, questions were uh, are raised about the future of Estonian language and culture. That this sense that was shared during the culture uh, among the cultural elites that the language is in danger, the culture is in danger because there is such a strong uh, emphasis on uh, imposing more and more Russian everywhere. So in this uh, in this sense, it was kind of I mean it was somewhat gloomy, somewhat depressing. Uh, and uh, and some people, yes, uh, felt very extremely that uh, the cultural situation is deteriorating. And I would also, you know, remind that Estonia is a very small culture. The last Soviet era census uh, uh, listed uh, people who identified as Estonians in the Soviet Union as barely over one million. So among the smallest of, of these uh, 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 nations in the Soviet Union who were granted their own republic, there were others who, like Tatars, for example, or who, who did not um, have their own republics and who had more difficulties than to, of sustaining their culture and their values. All right, but at the same time, uh, there was also plenty of uh, plenty of fun going on, plenty of uh, uh, you know just uh, average everydayness, which was which was quite you know well functioning. So people were not living in poverty. It was very common to have a summer home to go to. Uh, Northern Estonians watched Finnish TV. Uh, those in the countryside watched and heard, uh, listened to Voice of America. We, I all, all even have read some uh, uh, memoirs. How you know when do you uh, when do you milk your cows? This was dependent on what how uh, the Voice of America was aired. So you had to milk your cows before that. Uh, you know, before going to listening to radio. And that was just very, very common practice uh, in the countryside. In the northern coast, you know, if once you watch Finnish television, I uh, people did not so much care about the Voice of America, even though, of course, some people uh, did uh, listen to it regularly. And uh, so collective farms, kolkhozis, people who do not know very much of the Soviet uh, Soviet Union, they tend to think of these as like the most horrible things ever invented. So, and indeed the initial collectivization was like a really horrible, horrible process, which was devastating. There were then these uh, uh, famines, there was, yeah, that was just, um, very, very miserable time in the Soviet Union. However, by the 1980s, uh, and uh, especially in Estonia, but also in some other parts of the Soviet Union, a significant amount of kolhoses, if not all of them, were actually flourishing. It turned out to be quite a successful way to, to, run, um, uh, to run your, uh, uh, you know, agricultural, uh, economy. And uh, I would like to switch over now, stop sharing this and share a few images uh, from, uh, from my own slideshow, which also shows you some idea of how, gives you some idea how Kolhose is potentially good to, and let's move 
to the very beginning. And here is also a map of Estonia for you to note the extensive shoreline. So, and the neighbors then are of course Russian federations and then Latvian. And you can see a corner of Finland uh, on top. So Finland is very, very close. If it's a clear weather, you can see Finland from Estonia. And so thus there is also ferry traffic, which was reinitiated from 1965 and obviously Finnish television. But at the same time, this was one of the traumatic moments for Estonians with uh, annexation into the Soviet Union was that there were really very long, uh, long standing relations with Finland, with Sweden, and these were all cut through. So uh, cultural elites occasionally could actually go to Finland in the 1980s, but for that you had to first go to Moscow to get the visa. So, and then go uh, to Finland and getting a visa was just such a horrible, messy, messy uh, process. And, and again, it was possible only if you had some kind of uh, important uh, position in the system. For example, theatre directors, theatre groups, there was some exchange with Finland in the 1980s. Uh, but what I want to share with you also are some images from uh, one particular Estonian called Hose. This, is, this was called uh, uh, the Exemplar Efficient Collective Farm, called Hose, named after Kirov. So every, every, all institutions usually were named after this or that Soviet hero. hero. And here are a few images from, from that kolhoz. This is its main building. And uh, these images, uh, they are dated as like 70 to 80. So um, uh, the latest, uh, uh, we don't know for sure, but it cannot be later than uh, uh, 1980. So presumably some of these are maybe perhaps a little bit earlier, but it's basically, you know, the mood of the 1980s already here. So this is their one of the meeting rooms. This is their uh, just um, uh, some some uh, yeah leisure spot uh, in the main building. These are their uh, fishing boats. So they had a by the late 1950s they had 48 large trawlers and over 50 small trawlers, and the numbers were growing. So they did have their fish industry. They established smoke houses um, in different parts. They actually, there were more than one of them. And they started a canning factory for canning fish. And they also uh, started uh, producing uh, fishing and fish farming equipment. Because that was an issue of the Soviet Union the supply chains were just like an absolute misery. It was impossible to get something from somewhere. So their take was, we just produce everything ourselves. Yeah. And uh, they, so they produced cans for the fish industry. They produced fishing gear and they uh, uh, repaired fishing gear. They had woodworking, construction, repair officers. They had also modern fish farms, caviar workshops. Uh, they uh, manufactured aluminum cups and shampoo for the military. They produced hats, uh, they had souvenirs. And then they also had a winter garden. And, uh, and in the late 1970s, they uh, built an impressive flower shop uh, in the center of Tallinn. And um, in the 1980s, they opened a fish grill bar there and even a small hotel. So they had also their horticulture, dairy, pig, sheep, and poultry farms. And so here are a few more images from them. This is the palm house that they had. Then this is a stadium. Of course, you need a stadium. Um, my local bar. And then this one is their 
fashion atelier and uh, a hairdresser. So that's how it looks from inside. And here, you know, you can, um, this is tailors uh, trying on new, new outfits for the local, local Hosniks. And this is their car appear uh, place. Of course, you know, you, you wanted to be able to uh, repair your stuff. Here is their kindergarten, children playing in the water. And this is their, uh, their um, uh, basically equipment, how they work, uh, treat their fish. Uh, this is uh, one of the example of their homes where apartments where their workers live, but they were also smaller individual uh, uh, building uh, dwellings. And also an example of this is how we spend our evenings. Uh, and um, there was some um, uh, definitely interest in programming and uh, trying to, you know, computerize stuff in the 1980s. And uh, what's especially striking for me is that uh, in 1980, so this girl horse had, uh, had been in quite good, uh, you know, terms flourishing for 30 years and uh, they opened their uh, museum. So this is now a girl horse of the museum. So people were living incredibly well in the countryside. And you can just imagine if you have a very, uh, uh, you know, the company which is really well off, the people who are innovative uh, on top, but their uh, profits do not are not pocketed by, by, you know, a few owners, but actually whatever they produce, most of it is just, you know, used to, to produce welfare by every, for everyone. So in a place like that, typically people would uh, um, go, uh, they would have their buses that would take people to concerts, to theater shows, they would uh, go to vacation in maybe by the Black Sea or places like that. So was 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 kind of uh, almost like, you know, miracle on earth in some ways. But at the same time, the leadership constantly had to struggle with how to make it work. How, and it was kind of stretching the boundaries of what's permissible in the Soviet uh, Union all the time. So. Uh, but because they were so successful, once you were really successful, you were allowed a little bit more like, uh, uh, you know, invention, uh, inventiveness and, and, uh, and um, you know, possibilities for extension. And uh, of course, this was such a, a nice place that they would have people visiting uh, from all over, from the Soviet Union, but also from outside. So, so it was good to have such excellent Call horses. However, it was not the only one. This was perhaps uh, it was a massive, uh, massive thing. But uh, but uh, just call horses, uh, which were in good, good, uh, you know, were doing very well. These were not the rarity. All right, and I would also like to show you something from a popular culture, and this is. Uh, and just uh, also once more to remind you that this era was was weird and was also uh, uh, was very plural. You just had so many different impulses that fed into it. And I need to uh, change my uh, no, background. This is not what I wanted to do. Let's see how I can do it now. Sorry, I usually do not uh, share so many different things during one session. Let me see, how can I, how can I, okay, now I could get out of my, and I need to change my screen, but I think now I should be able to, yes. And now I want to share also sound with you. And this is, let's watch about two minutes or a little bit less from, uh, uh, and uh, what it is. This is a, 
uh, Tallinn Film Production, which is made at the request of the Central All Union Television and uh, Radio uh, Committee. So the Estonian actors and singers who sing and talk in Russian uh, for presumably for all Soviet audience. Остановитесь, мисс Дейзи! Подождись, мисс Дейзи! Ой, мое большое сердце! Мисс Дейзи, может, поможете создать в этом доме более нормальную обстановку? Боюсь, что развод неизбежен. Поэтому я всегда предлагаю очень либеральный брачный контракт. Верно. Поэтому я слегка отредактировала наш контракт. Теперь он мне подходит вполне. Что это такое? Мисс Дейзи! Если я решаю с тобой разводиться, я даю тебе деньги и покупаю виллу на Ривьере. Нет, тогда я отказываюсь от контракта. Почему? Потому что я хочу... Окей, мисс Лапа. Теперь вы мне нравитесь еще больше. Хорош, восточный у нас закон. Сколько хочешь, имеешь жен. Но если станешь ты законную женой, хватит мне и одной. Нас не осудят за этот шаг, если будет законный брак. Но до того, как я согласие дам, надо условиться нам. Мы одной связаны судьбой. На век забыть капризы свои мы должны для блага семьи. Здесь залезть на пяту, нужно петь дуэтом, И не спорить вечно, кто в семье лопак. Только нет секрета, что в таких дуэтах За женой всегда последние слова. Дейзи, милая, милая моя, Знают даже дети, что в таком дуэте За женой всегда последние слова. Ведет нас к счастью дорога одна, Разлучаться теперь нельзя. Не расстаются до последних дней Роза и соловей. Счастливый случай нас свел с тобой, Женатый лучше, чем холостой. Пришла пора и соловью, Розу он выбрал свою. Мы одной связаны судьбой, Навек забыть капризы свои Мы должны для блага семьи. And let's stop here. Uh, so that was quite amazing, isn't it? Of course, the swimsuit is the absolute pearl here. And what was it? So this was a, a, a ball at the Savoy, Paul Abraham Operetta, which pre premiered in Berlin in 1932, just before Hitler coming into power. And uh, this was actually uh, staged um, in the 1930s in very many, uh, very many uh, theaters in, in, in Europe at least, and also in then still independent Estonian Republic. And uh, in 1982, this operetta was staged in Estonia theater and it was incredibly, incredibly popular. I remember my own mother was just a very, uh, she loved the singer Helgi Salla who, who performed in the theater spectacle and, uh, and my mother loved the show. And it was so famous and then there was a request to produce it as a film. The film was actually pretty awful in all kinds of ways. Uh, the critics didn't say a good word. I mean, there was a lot of going back and forth between Tallinn and Moscow and like, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. And uh, it was not, it was, it, it's just, uh, it's embarrassing even to watch, but at, at the same time, it's just like such an example of that pre-collage of different things that you could do during the Soviet era. So you do have this famous singer 
arriving to Nice from the United States and presumably is all like full of new ideas, uh, uh, like women's liberation, women, women are the one who deciding the, the deals in their marriage contract, like, okay, if I, the woman, want to uh, give a divorce, to you, my husband, I'm gonna give you a villa, uh, you know, as a, you know, just a substitution. So quite remarkable uh, in all kinds of ways. And uh, I would, this is how I would like to uh, finish this talk, just as a reminder that things were very uh, diverse. There was definitely, there was an openness to the West in these early 1980s, there was also plenty of ideological pressure to, to rationalize the, the society more and more. So altogether, I think Estonians were very, very ready uh, when the perestroika started and they could start pushing things towards independence. And so thank you. I'm happy to uh, respond to the questions. Hey, um... Thank you. Uh, that was a fascinating talk and, and, and certainly uh, reflective of the diversity, which I hadn't realized at all really in Estonia in the 1980s. Um, I can see that we have uh, uh, a couple of questions coming through, but one here, firstly, um, I mean, I, I think at the start of the talk, they, they said that we might not be able to give people the, the option to kind of speak their question, but I think I might be able to try and do this actually. So. Uh, Gizem, I might be able to give you, um, allow you to kind of ask your question, which might be a bit more straightforward. So I'm just going to give this, give this a go. Okay, so you might be able to um, I... ask your question. <laughs> Let's try this. Okay, I don't know how to turn on my video, so maybe you can do it. You don't have to. Um, I had two questions. One was kind of you talked about towards the end concerning the uh, opening and like how they were looking towards the West. Basically, my question was what kind of economic shifts occurred during early 1980s in Estonia and if that shaped the cultural milieu. And my second question is about the affective regimes of this area. And I know you worked on affect and uh, public emotions. And I was wondering if you're also looking into the relationship between 1980s and shifting emotional registers in Estonia during early 1980s or not. That's about it. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, these are two so rich questions. To start with economy, uh, so economic changes mm -hmm. in the early 1980s, they were not very substantial changes there were but, uh, but there was maybe like from the second half of the 1970s onwards there was already talk of uh, economic autonomy in the soviet union and kolhoses at that time were a little bit of an example because they could keep some of their profits not all of it but some of it so so, but at the same time, uh, of course, it was incredibly regulated all and uh, what annoyed a lot uh, with local leadership and also just whoever was a, a head of enterprises was that everything had to go through Moscow. So there were three kinds of enterprises. There were all union enterprises, for example, all the energy, energy economy, like electricity production, mines and all that, these were fully under Soviet, uh, Soviet uh, uh, leadership. So locals had no word whatsoever in what was being decided there. And then there was a uh, mixed uh, uh, national and all union uh, enterprises. And the word on the street was that the, uh, in principle still, um, or the last word was always at the all union level in these enterprises. So, so again, the locals did not have much to say there, and that was incredibly annoying. So, and you know, it was uh, generally understood as this is a colonial regime. There is a center somewhere who doesn't care what they are thinking, and uh, and uh, they make decisions that pertain to, for example, our environment. 
Uh, but that started changing then uh, with uh, uh, Perestroika starting from about 1986. And then there's more openness and there's intense conversations about how we could change the economy. And very quickly, uh, it leads to thinking towards like, okay, we need independence. This is the only way to do it. Mm. And then about effective regimes, uh, Again, it's it's very interesting. I think what we see is there is a certain pluralization that's uh, taking place. I'm actually right now writing a piece which uh, talks about postmodernism and neoliberalism in late 1980s Estonia. How you basically have um, after uh, Gorbachev's reform start, let's say about after 1987, because there is a little bit of lag before you know people even start noticing that something is changing. Then there is this, um, you know, more and more growing excitement. Like, wow, maybe something's going to change. There's a lot of public conversation going on on different topics. You already have demonstrations and like this like really the major dominant effective regime, if you read people's memoirs, for example, is just like excitement. But of course, these are just moments. I mean, you cannot be excited just years, uh, long period constantly. So you have these flashes of excitement, but the background is also, I think, uh, uh, early 1980s and already in, uh, late 1970s, you could you could say that there's something like postmodern uh, affective regime uh, where people just do not care very much about many things. There's a sense that uh, you know there's no future. That thing is just the repetition of the same. And this will change again with Gorbachev, but but before that, there's really this sense that okay, we are here forever. There's no way out of that that Soviet, you know, empire, and 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 you do have this kind of a, a blessed fair attitude, or or in if you look at the, the arts, you do have you know typical postmodern situation. There's a fragmentation of the subject, no belief in like constructing great narratives and um, and uh, and people are just more interested in the personal lives, etc. Just, you know, staying in their summer homes and um, enjoying their life as much as possible. And then during the Perestroika era, I also see that there is a bit of a clash there between this like postmodern subject and postmodern affect, which is like, yeah, well, you know, whatever. And then there are these revolutionary modes. So it's interesting how you can actually perceive in also in cultural works how how these two two regimes, I would say, they they clash occasionally. But thank you for this question. It was very, very, very interesting. Okay, um, I've got a question, um, if you don't mind me asking one, it's about, um, I was struck when um, you were at the start of your talk, where you, talk, when you mentioned the Russian language being used um, quite extensively and increasingly, but also the pictures which were you, you were showing in the background, uh, there were lots of examples of Estonian people wearing like national dress, um, so it, it, it's firstly that kind of that, that difference, but what it, it reminded me of is something I'm more familiar with, which is uh, Soviet national policy in the 1920s, 1930s. Um, the 1920s, um, it, with indigenization, as it was known, it was, it was, the focus was about nation building and the way that the party wanted to do that was through um, Soviet language. So having a lot of leeway with um, different languages because this was seen to be a way to build nations um, whereas in the 1930s under Stalin, this turned to the friendship of the people's campaign. And that was where Russification of language came in. And that's where I see the similarity, but un under Stalin, there was celebration of other cultures, but it felt very much like just a celebration of ethnic diversity in the Soviet Union, rather than anything, the celebration of another nation. And I don't know if this, that, that, that seemed like a, a point of similarity, but then what you think about that, and is any of this 
nationality policy or Russian language? Is, is it to do with the fact that Estonia was a republic of the Soviet Union? I don't know how relevant that was compared to other areas and the, the sensitivity which might surround uh, republics as, as having that particular status. So, um, sorry, there's a couple of questions in there. So thank you. Yes, thank you. I mean, this is such an important, uh, you know, just a set of question, uh, questions. Um, indeed, I mean, 1920s uh, uh, it was was just a very, 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 very different era, right? And I'm uh, often I'm uh, trying to remind people that Soviet Union felt very different for those uh, who started there in the 1920s where you do have indigenization policies and uh, and uh, for some uh, ethnic groups uh, it was the best era in their history like for example uh, uh, komi uh, people or some smaller uh, ethnicities that uh, after that period they've always had tr uh, trouble uh, establishing any kind of uh, you know place for their culture and then uh, those uh, parts of, uh, you know, uh, which became still and uh, which became an extended Soviet Union who were next after or during the World War II, and they started under Stalin. And it was, it started with like just very, very, very repressive regimes. So that just led to a very different, uh, you know, um, relationship to the, to the Soviet rule. And the, the whole question of national dress is here so interesting because this is again something that's been pointed out in terms of 1930s when indeed you also, you get this the great uh, Russian nation discourse uh, emerging, Stalin just very consciously reversing the initial course. And now there is a clear, rhetoric that Russians are the leading uh, nation, they are, they just are essentially like braver and more stronger and smarter than any other nation. And that's, uh, and then Russians are extending their helping hand. And during that era, you do have all these folk dresses are still around, right? But the, um, I, I think David Brandenberger has really wonderfully analyzed it. It's basically the other cultures are ossified. You are still in your, you know, 19th century national dresses. This is how you are allowed to express your, your, you know, your own face or whatever, which, uh, which uh, you know, is just face of the past. Whereas Russia was in the modern developing, helping other nation. And another really interesting aspect of it, which I've um, written in my book, is that the whole national culture was also overwritten by some ideas of how it's supposed to look like. So you did have this um, classic Russian ballet and uh, the folk groups were established as part of that ballad tradition. And uh, uh, these, um, you know, ballad style folk uh, dance was then introduced and basically, you know, imposed, but actually also accepted in, in uh, all parts of the Soviet Union. So what they are doing now with their uh, folk costumes there are also there's song festivals in Estonia and dance festivals. And, you know, you have similar events in other places. And, uh, but this is not the folk dance that they are dancing. This is basically a ballet. So you need to have pointed toes. You need to have this like ballet hand postures. You need to have synchronicity of the ballet, like this very clear, you know, structure to it, which is not at all how the folk culture was about. So, yeah, so some really interesting, curious changes that are happening during this era. And the question of the status of the Republic, I think that was that was uh, inc absolutely crucial. Indeed, you're absolutely right that the, these cultures, which did not get uh, such recognition, you would say, um, they had much more trouble with sustaining some cultural identity. 
And for Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, definitely the fact that they used to be independent republics, the, there was already, you know, this was a culture which relied on certain, you know, institutional uh, support in earlier years, whereas many other cultures that were part of the Soviet Union had never experienced that. So that was that was indeed a big big difference. And then what also uh, worked for Estonian benefits was that the Estonian language is a Finno-Greek language, which is very, very different from Slavic languages. So, uh, which means that basically English and German are close, closer to Russian than Estonia is. Because, you know, you have the Indo-European languages where Slavic languages are part of it, but also uh, Romanic languages like Italian, Spanish, and also uh, English is the same family. And then the Finno Ugrian languages are very, very different. It's a completely different branch where there's Estonia, Finnish, Hungarian, and then some smaller language groups. Uh, and that meant that the, uh, it was easier for Estonians just to not learn Russian because it was so different. And it was easier to just switch off from the propaganda in Russian. Because, for example, for me, I studied uh, in high school during the Soviet era. We did have, for example, military education in Russian. We just didn't understand it. So we ignored it. We did other stuff in that class. And it was just like a big joke. So in a way, it was a defense. The language was a defense. and. And of course, that made it even more painful when there was such a big pressure to, to um, add more Russian to, to Estonian curricula and impose more Russian on the public sphere and everywhere. Yeah, thank you for this. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a fascinating uh, subject. Uh, are there any other questions for anyone else in the, in the room? Because I've got, I've got one. I see Jim's got his hand up, so I'll just give them that permission. There you go, Jim, you should be able to talk once you're on mute. Okay, um, I said, um, yeah, my camera's not going, that's okay. Um, yeah, um, thank you so much, that was fantastic. Um, brilliant images, I think, you know, shows the, the real richness of your research and uh, just wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, my question actually goes back to what you said at the very beginning, uh, when you talked about the two 1980s, um, the idea of, you know, perhaps the maybe into like the, the late 70s, early into the mid 80s and um, then, then onwards. And it got me thinking about the the two, like maybe think about like the, 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 the long 60s or the short 60s, um, the good 60s and the bad 60s, how some historians view um, that decade now. Um, of course, famously over in British historiography, you have the long 18th century and so on. So I was just wondering, um, especially as any kind of students or um, historians looking for a, a hook to hang their hat on, if you will, do you think this idea of the 280s is, um, can be used quite easily um, by historians in their, in their research? Does that make sense? Yes, I think if you're looking at the Soviet Union and in the Eastern Bloc, I think it's just very clearly there. Because indeed with the Gorbachev reforms, something like a new era begins. Of course, there is a different way to look at the era, which is like, uh, um, you know, starting from the idea that Gorbachev did not come from just nowhere, right? Uh, he was put into power because uh, Soviet state had reached such a, you know, state of affairs, uh, economic st uh, stagnation was the main thing, that something had to change. So you could also write the story of a, you know, durée where you have stagnation that leads to necessity for for renewalment, and thus there is a, you know, general agreement uh, at the top of the uh, Soviet Union, like Council of Ministers and etc., etc., Central Committee, that yes, we need someone who is who can who can you know, start change. So that would be the long durée story. So in some ways, maybe uh, um, if you are writing a political history, that would perhaps make more sense. 
However, if you are uh, writing more of a cultural history, like how uh, stuff like effective regimes or how people experience their, uh, then there's definitely uh, uh, a split, there's definitely a sense of a new beginning of something completely new emerging. And, uh, and again, if you want, you can look and see the signs already in the early 1980s. But, uh, but uh, the fact that now you can actually talk about things uh, in a public sphere, you can publish stuff in 1987 already that was absolutely unthinkable in 1981. That it's, so both, both stories are possible. Then the, I think the, the question is what's your what's your interest and what's your angle? But I do think that if you are looking more like a popular history, cultural history, then the two 1980s in the uh, East European and Soviet context would make a lot of sense. However, if you're looking maybe in some other parts of the Soviet Union, in some parts, actually, uh, Berestroika did not quite happen in a similar way. So. Uh, you know, these uh, some republics, just maybe Belarusia would be one example. They were not quite on board, and they did not quite like understand. Or, and there, maybe the long durée would still make more sense than than the two 1980s. So, so it is a question also: what what particular area are you looking at? But thank you for that. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we, we might have time for uh, one more quick question if anyone anyone has um, one. I, I, I've got I've got one. If if not, um, just I don't know if you have to answer this kind of quickly, but um, it, I'm reminded of uh, Stephen Cotkin's argument uh, in on civil society that there was no um, civil society but in uh, Eastern Europe before 1989. But I think you kind of show the complexity of Estonian society in, 19, in the 1980s. And that seems to go, um, at least in my view, against kind of, you know, Cotkin's kind of like quite provocative argument that he made in that book. And I just wondered if you've got any kind of comments in, in that direction. Yes, uh, again, a really um, very good question. I think there was civil society uh, before 1989. I mean, obviously before 1989, there was it was very publicly visible starting from about 1987 in Estonia. But already, you know, in the very stagnation era, uh, maybe the fact that this folk culture was allowed was legitimized by the Soviet rule. Uh, that was one of the you know venues where you could have something like civil society because you had uh, for example male choirs and people have uh, you know talked about what they did this is just a group of men coming together having fun they they uh, in their free time they sing all kinds of songs okay in concerts they they need to make sure that these are you know legitimate uh, legitimate songs but otherwise they 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 talk quite freely they do um and they do uh, express their ideas. And then another thing which I've actually researched quite a bit is the environmental movements. And this is part of the Soviet Estonia already uh, from the 1950s. So, and this means that you have groups of people uh, who just go together someplace exploring the nature, uh, Earlier times is smaller groups, people walking, later times are bus loads. So you come with several buses. And there were tens of thousands, thousands of people in this uh, uh, environmental society. So that was a very powerful movement. And again, you could come together, you, or, you know, we have some kind of an environmental event, but you could quite freely then criticize the regime. And you could also, these were the, uh, movements that were connected with ideas all over the world. So it was global. So they knew about books like Rachel Carson's. Uh, you, they knew about the Rome report, uh, Limit to Growth. They discussed all that. 
So in a way, it was even kind of a global culture in this sense. And yes, there were def definitely aspects of civil society as part of it. Even Komsomol, there's a lot of uh, in, uh, talk about how Komsomol uh, uh, groups could have been quite, you know, free in their expression. Of course, in some uh, some moments, then they were, you know, shut down, and there was change of uh, of leadership. But then again, slight, uh, it grew. So there was some civil society. Yes. Yes, yeah, so I think I agree with you. Um, so uh, I think that brings us to uh, the end. Uh, we're out of time. It is. It is. Uh, we've done with an hour so uh thank you uh very much uh for a fascinating talk it's been a pleasure to chair this um jim you are still on the channel so i don't know if you want to uh, say any concluding concluding words while you are why you still kind of uh, have the ability to do so um yeah just obviously thank you so much to um to Ed for giving a, a fantastic really rich talk i think it's a real example of what hopefully our, our network will, will be about going forward thank you pete for the, for the cameo um, um, it'd be great to have a Soviet expert share this, and hopefully you'll be kind enough to help out again um, in the future um, if we uh, if, if if we need need, need your assistance. Um, so yeah, thank you all, and thank you all for coming as well. And uh, I'll send out some updates with uh, um, the link to book on for our next um, 1980s seminar, which is with Derek Katzen um, next week, and also the link again for the Neil Kinnock event too. So look out for my updates, please. And but thank you all for coming, and thank you for being. Part of, part, of, part of the network. Thank okay. you. So um, I, I think with that, I, I think I will end the webinar very soon and that will kind of end proceedings and stop recording and everything else. So uh, thanks again to App and um, I'm going to end the webinar now. So thanks all, all for coming along. Bye-bye.